good to be with you today. I don't know if you uh, if you realize this, but America is not at its best right now. Now, I don't know when it ever was, but I know that this version of the nation that we live in seems like it's struggling. And if I were to ask you what the biggest problem America has right now, if you had to boil it down to one or maybe two of the core issues facing us, what would you choose? What, when you look around at the world and you see who we are and how we are, what would you say the problem is? How do you explain what's going on here? Make America great again. Okay, we have a Make America Great Again. We have a Republicans. What else? What is the what is going on here? What's the problem? Fear. Lack of agreement. Lack of agreement. Broken community. Inability to listen and respect others. What is that? Oppression. Oppression. Entitlement. Entitlement. Intentional miscommunication. Inequality, money. So we got a lot of problems. What are we going to do about it? Well, I was thinking about trying to frame all of this stuff that I thought you would bring up. And it comes down to, I think, a story problem. Because we all have a story that we tell ourselves about who we are, about what matters in this life about what we are doing here. And that story informs and influences and directs everything that we do. You brought a story in here and everyone watching online has their story. And I think the divide that we have is a story divide. It's not really just Republican versus Democrat. It's not progressive versus conservative. It's not black or white. It's a vision divide. It's a, it's a divide in how we see ourselves and the world and people and resources. It's along the lines of empathy. There are people, it seems, who are fueled by compassion. And there does seem to be a group of people who are fueled, for whatever reason, by cruelty. It seems there are people who live with open hands and there are some who live with clenched fists. It does seem that there are people who see this world and its opportunity and its resources as abundant and there are some who see, I have to get mine and that life is a zero-sum game and for me to gain, for me to, for someone else to gain, I have to lose. It does seem that some people see the world as an interdependent community and some people see America first. It does seem that way. The problem here is that we are dealing with what I'm going to call the terrible twos. See, in reality, there are two different versions of the world. There's the world we wish to be true, and then there's the world that exists. There is the how things would be in a perfect world, and then there is how this imperfect one actually is when we have to walk around in it. In reality, there are two different versions of us. We have an aspirational version of ourselves, the kind of person we'd like to be, the kind of person we hope to be, the kind of person we try to be. There's the person we even tell ourselves that we are, and then there is, practically speaking, who we actually are. The person that other people experience when they are in close proximity to us in relationship. Or the version of us they get at a distance, maybe from work or from school. Or maybe that they get from a great distance on social media or in traffic. And there are two different versions of America. There is the country that the documents and the anthems and the songs say we are, and then there is the nation we have actually been and currently are, the one that might not be as equal or as just or as available as it's been advertised. 
And there are two different versions of humanity. The things we generally believe about all people, about humanity as a whole, and then there are those people. When they show up and we encounter them individually and collectively. We have a story that we tell ourselves about their goodness or their decency or their empathy and then the true story that unfolds every day when we encounter said people. Two comedians, two comic minds that I love talk about people in different ways. George Carlin said, I love people when I meet them one by one. People are just wonderful as individuals. You can see the whole universe in their eyes if you look carefully, but as soon as they begin to group, as soon as they begin to clot when there are five of them or ten of them, or even a group as small as two, they begin to change. They sacrifice the individual for the sake of the group, and they can become difficult. Now, Larry David, who is a writer, he, his character in Curb Your Enthusiasm was confronted by his wife, who was surprised he was getting involved in local politics because he said he was doing it to help people. And she said, but you hate people. And Larry said, I hate people individually, but I love mankind. So there is often that idea of humanity. We love individuals, but we struggle with groups of people or the opposite, that we, we really struggle with people in their cruelty, but as an idea, we have it in our head. So maybe the difference in all these stories is our expectation and our reality, our expectation of America and our reality of it, our expectation of ourselves and the reality of who we are our expectation of what this nation should be and the reality of what it is. I share all this today because we are here in the tension between the what could be and the what is. We are in the space between the what could be and the what is. And the gap between those is the stuff that breaks our hearts. It is the stuff that makes us angry. It is the stuff that keeps us up at night. More accurately, though, I think the tension is that we know what the world really is, and we wish more people could embrace it. We believe that things should be better, and we wonder why it isn't. Maybe the frustration that you feel and I feel is because we want others to know what is really happening here because they have a really bad story about what's happening here. So here's what I think I know. I think I know that we are in this life together. All of us. We and the people we love. We and the people we don't like. And we and the people that we can't stand. I think I know that diversity is truly the best thing for us. Diversity of culture, of experience, of perspective. In the what actually is, in reality, we are a singular interdependent community. All the separations of nation and border and political affiliation and theological tradition are unnatural ones created by us to combat the fear and the tribalism that we are immersed in. Separations that only serve to muddy the waters of the reality that we are one people. In the what actually is, the differences of pigmentation, of gender, of orientation, of preference, they're just smaller distinctions that are transcended by the universal parts of being human that unite us. I think that's what I know. And I think I know that we're all connected even when we can't see it or refuse to acknowledge it or actively push against it. I think that is the what is. Do you believe that's true? In spirituality, this is the concept of oneness. It is supposedly at the heart of most faith traditions. It's at the core of the best of philosophy. It says there's no them, there is only us. There are not just two antithetical sides. There aren't two massive groups that we can put ourselves in and that we need to choose one group or the other. The fierce tribalism of these days tells us that 
this is the way it is. But deep down, a community like this is predicated on the uniqueness of the individual story, but that we are all collectively part of one bigger shared story. That the ripples of my life touch yours. That they touch lives all over in ways that we can't measure or imagine. Some people even point to our bodies being made of cells that die and regenerate, including our epidermis. So there's no true separation between our bodies and the rest of creation. Eckhart Tolle says, the more we expand our consciousness and embrace the idea of oneness, the more we will experience peace, harmony, and love in our lives. Buddha says, in separateness lies the world's great misery, in compassion lies the world's true strength. And as that sage Bono said, we are one, but we're not the same. (laughs) So the good news is that this is the truth. This is reality. We are one. Oneness is the natural state. It is the objective condition. And if we got fear and tribalism and selfishness and greed and desire for power out of the way, we would all see it. So the good news is that. But now that I've told you all that, let's talk about the other side. Because some people haven't gotten the oneness memo. They are the terrible twos. They are living in two-ness. The unfortunate news is that binary, tribal, dualistic messages have so permeated many people's heads and so polluted their hearts that they are unable to live into that larger truth of oneness anymore. They don't even see it. They can't even imagine that it is possible. Their politics has told them to be terribly afraid because the bad people are everywhere, and so they'd better make sure they have their guns, and they put up their walls, and they guard their borders. Their religion has regularly warned them that the evil, immoral people are everywhere waiting to overtake them so they make monsters out of refugees and transgender teenagers and history professors. Their media has continually created encroaching hordes of enemies for them at every turn at the border, in school curriculums, at drag shows. They have been so weaned on culture war rhetoric that they are perpetually terrified of Muslims and immigrants and rainbow t-shirts and vaccines and gay children and Harry Potter and Starbucks cups and science and wind turbines, everything. In that state of being perpetually terrified, oneness is a virtual impossibility. So we all believe in oneness as the reality that we sometimes ignore or sometimes forget but we are living alongside people whose instinct is two-ness, is separation, is division. Because we are facing a movement in recent years here that is fueled by resistance to real diversity and to true inclusion. It does not believe that we all do better when we all do better. It is a movement that pits America against everyone that says you are with me or you're against me. And that believes someone else's gain is my loss. The Tunis movement is trying to erase the teachings of America's history of racism. The Tunis movement is trying to erase transgender people, trying to erase voters of color. And I believe this is the greatest struggle for people of faith, morality, and conscience like you. How do we live into our interdependence as a people when there are so many who refuse to acknowledge and who even fight against it. This week I watched supposed grown adults parading through Target stores, screaming about pride clothing, as if it was some personal attack on them, as if their lives were diminished by another person's affirmation. Most of these people claim to have a God who so loved the world and a Jesus who says love your neighbor as yourself and yet they are so threatened by a rainbow t-shirt designed for someone else to wear to declare their own worth that they will pick it and complain and boycott the store for selling it. 
Tunis is so much a part of their minds that they can't imagine anything else. They've done the same with a beer company for its promotion using a transgender person. In other words, a huge portion of this nation is so stuck in duality and a battle posture, so incensed, so threatened, so personally injured at the mere acknowledgement of the existence of LGBTQ people that they cannot allow it because it feels like an attack on them. They cannot fathom oneness with a gay man or a transgender woman. It's the same reason the call to declare that black lives matter is turned into some all lives matter evasion that refuses to uplift the inherent humanity of people of color because they cannot really fathom oneness with them. And so, friends, in the name of oneness, we now have to actively oppose the separators and the book banners and the wall builders. In the name of oneness, we have to make the terrible twos feel the discomfort of being confronted with the reality of oneness. And that's going to feel like bad news. When you have lived in a mindset of us and them forever, when you're told that there is only us, that's problematic. Fox News can't run on oneness. Political extremism can't survive on oneness. Inflammatory religion has no need for oneness. Now you might be saying, John, uh, you, you're calling out the dualistic thinking of a group of people and declaring them the problem. Aren't you actually preventing or inhibiting oneness yourself? Aren't you embodying the terrible twos? If you're saying that, please leave. <laughs> or log off. Here's the difference. The difference is that I want the same things for people practicing dualism that I want for every other human being. Despite my fierce and direct objections to policy and to practice, I know that people opposite me politically and theologically are connected to me. I believe they're of the same inherent worth as people who agree with me. I don't believe they are less worthy of love or morally defective or going to hell if I believed such a place existed. I know that our fortunes and our destinies are tied together. And that's why even as I fight with them, I fight for them. I really do care about them. I care about them far more than the former president they worship does. I care about them more than the politicians they vote for do. I care more about them than the media members they watch, more than the ministers who manipulate them. See, I want affordable health care for my family, but I want it for theirs. I want qualified teachers for their children as much as for my own. I want an unpolluted planet for their futures in addition to mine. I want them to be able to have autonomy over their own bodies, to be able to marry the person they love, to be able to have a vote and a say. And I want a nation free from a proliferation of guns because the bullets from those guns are nonpartisan in the damage that they do. And because that feeling is not reciprocal, we find ourselves appearing to be in the Battle of Tunis. But we, friends, as long as any group's human and civil rights are in danger, or being taken away or up for debate, the war for oneness is not over and we need to be on the front lines of it. People committed to oneness cannot abide the dehumanization of any human being or any group of human beings. It cannot tolerate discrimination, whether personal or institutional or legislative. And right now, we need to be in the fight for oneness. So how do we do that? We fight for oneness by pursuing empathy relentlessly. We stay in a posture of curiosity about everyone we meet. Never assume you know fully enough that you stop asking questions about who people are and why they do what they do and why they believe what they believe. Those you love, those you don't like, and those you have trouble liking at all. Because oneness says there is inherent value in them. 
And empathy keeps seeking to learn about the other and is willing to be surprised. And we fight for oneness by having gratitude for the connectedness that we find wherever we find it. We feel the commonality between people. We feel it personally in relationships or we see it embodied somewhere else. We need to dwell upon it. We need to give thanks for it. We need to cultivate it. Because it is easy now to only see the division, to only notice the fractures, to only be aware of the tribalism. And in a fight for oneness, we have to have eyes that see more deeply. And we fight for oneness by working for oneness incrementally keep looking for the ways to express the interconnectedness of people in the small and the close of your life find small practices to support the inherent worth of all people and our interdependence by doing what you can you don't need to save the world but you can save the small portion of it that you happen to be standing on so the fight for oneness tries to save that small world and we fight for oneness by outwardly opposing binary side choosing. See, believing in oneness doesn't mean we soften our language or compromise our convictions or avoid activism so that it might make people not uncomfortable. Those practicing two-ness should be uncomfortable because that discomfort is the path to realizing that our separateness is a myth. It's precisely because we believe in oneness that we push back against the myth of our separation. And we fight for oneness by humanizing the dehumanized and normalizing the marginalized. Friends, we need to be specific about the people we value and the things that we demand and the things that we will not abide. Avoid dangerous ambiguity, but speak with clarity. Affirm transgender teenagers. Demand the value of a black life be honored. Speak with specificity in these things to those who believe that some groups are less than or abnormal. And so those groups can be reminded that they are not, that the only thing abnormal is the irrational fear and stereotyping and caricaturizing that causes all this. Having openly LGBTQ people in faith communities and on school boards and in companies should be commonplace. And until it is, we have to wake up the imaginations of those who have had them stolen by fear and tribalism. We need to normalize representation and diversity as oneness would demand it. And we fight for oneness by modeling collective, collaborative community. We have to give people an alternative that they can point to. One of our children's friends talked about them trying out a mega church not far from here. And the pastor began speaking openly anti-trans rhetoric from the pulpit. Thousands of people right here are being weaned on that kind of hatred. And I love that today we're having a training right after the service on how to help refugees and immigrants feel at home. That kind of work is oneness work. And it shouldn't be a rarity. It should be our lifeblood. And we should be loud about how much we affirm oneness. So part of the job of community is to not be its best kept secret. Begin inviting people to oneness by inviting them to the work that we do together. And the last thing is we fight for oneness by fighting two-ness inside of us because when i asked you the problem it was real easy to say they are the problem they're not the problem but the place where they are stuck in is the problem and if we could help people recognize that we are for them maybe the battle postures would drop our interdependence is an optional it just is we are all tethered to one another here in this life, and even when we do our best to silo ourselves off, that distance is only an illusion. We know this, or at least we think we know this. We know that some people are still not yet welcomed at the table, and other people believe they own the table. And so we need to find our place in the lives of both of these 
kinds of people because if we truly believe we're all connected, then we can't stop fighting with and for people. The terrible twos cannot define the future here if there is to be one. We cannot be the terrible twos. We must be the wonderful ones 